course for one hour. Dr. Shankriti. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarak. Thank you very much, everybody. Happy to see you again today. Yesterday, I talked about the borders of moral community and through a comparative perspective, I try to explain the internal logic of Islamic morality, or what our Professor Dr. Tarek called the, uh, the logic in turn uh, of Islamic ethics. Uh, today, I want to talk about the internal logic of Islamic political thought and history. And the title is The Constitutional Crisis of Islamic Civilization. And what I mean by constitutional crisis is this clash over uh, the uh, political legitimacy within Islamic civilization and the impact, the very negative impact that clash over political legitimacy caused in Islamic civilization throughout centuries until today we are still suffering from this problem of political legitimacy. So uh, the lecture is almost a comment on this saying of my favorite uh, thinker and poet, Muhammad Iqbal. As usual, I started with a quote from Iqbal, as I did yesterday. But today is not about uh, morality or universality of moral principles, but rather it's about the political history of Islam. Uh, in a very famous letter that Iqbal wrote to the uh, English Orientalist Nicholson in 1991, uh, he, uh, he said, Muslims succeeded in building a great empire, but thereby they largely repaganized their potential, their political ideals. They repaganized their political ideals and lost sight of some of the most important potentialities of their faith. So this is Iqbal summarized, actually, uh, I can say the problem of Islamic political history in a few sentences. Yes, Muslims build a great empire like other nations, Roman Empire, Persian Empire, Chinese Empire. But by doing that, there was also a great loss, which is loss of the Islamic political ideals themselves and the potential of these ideals in Islamic life. Uh, <clears throat> Al Shahrastani, who lived uh, in the 11th century, uh, one of the great Muslim scholars, he's one of the great references on Islamic sects and divisions within the Muslim community. And his book, Al Milal wa Nihal, is a classic, a classic on this. He noticed this problem of political legitimacy as the main source of division in Islamic civilization. And he wrote about that, وَأَعْلَمُ خِلَافٍ بَيْنَ الْأُمَّةِ خِلَافُ الْإِمَامَةِ Ah, I'm sorry. I have two computers. وَأَعْلَمُ خِلَافٍ بَيْنَ الْأُمَّةِ خِلَافُ الْإِمَامَةِ إِذْ مَا سُلَّ سَيْفٌ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ عَلَى قَاعِدَةٍ دِينِيَّةٍ مثل ما سل على الإمامة في كل زمان. In the English translation of the book, and there is one available online, the greatest dispute in the Ummah has been that over the Imam or political leadership, you can say political legitimacy. For no sword has been drawn in Islam on a religious question as it has been drawn on the question of the Imam throughout the age. Most of these civil wars in Islamic history, starting from the civil wars in the time of the first generation of Sahaba, the Battle of Jamal, the Battle of Safin, and so on, most of this was 
caused by dispute over the issue of political leadership and political legitimacy. Uh, in, politi in political uh, philosophy and political sociology, there are mainly two sources of destruction of the states in general. One is from above and one is from below. And Abdullah ibn Abbas, one of the great Sahaba and scholar of the Holy Quran, he has a very interesting interpretation of one of the verses of the Quran, which is verse 65 of Surah Al-An'am, in which Allah Azza wa Jalla says in Quran, قُلْ هُوَ الْقَادِرُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَلَابًا مِّنْ فَوْقِكُمْ أَوْ مِنْ تَحْتِ أَرْجُلِكُمْ أَوْ يَلْبِسَكُمْ شِيَعَ وَيُذِيقَ بَعْضَكُمْ بَأْسَبَعَ it is he alone who has the power to let loose upon you suffering from above you or from beneath your feet. This translation of the first uh, sentence of the, of the verse. So what kind of punishment or suffering from above and what kind of punishment suffering come from below? Abdullah ibn Abbas said, Suffering from above you is tyranny, and suffering from beneath your feet is anarchy. These are the two main sources of destruction of the political life, whether you have tyranny or you have anarchy. And we'll see that uh, Islamic history started, the problem or the constitutional crisis of Islamic civilization started with anarchy and ended with tyranny. And actually, anarchy leads to tyranny. It's the moral justification of tyranny. When you, when you read in political philosophy like Hobbes, for example, all of his theory is about that we, we need an absolute monarch because without that, we will we'll live in anarchy. So uh, anarchy is always the moral justification of, of tyranny. And this is exactly what happened in, in Islamic history. That is the crisis of Islamic civilization. Uh, okay. Based on uh, what uh, Ibn Abbas said about this verse, based on the remark of Shahrastani, we can say with confidence that the deepest crisis of Islamic civilization is at the heart a constitutional crisis. It's about political legitimacy. No issue has divided Muslims in the past more than this. And this chronic disease is still the main cause of the stagnation and anarchy we still have today in Muslim sites. Whether you have the anarchy of ISIS or you have the tyranny of Assad, for example, or Qaddafi or anyone else. Or Sisi, of course, I, I, I cannot find it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you don't need to remind me of Sisi. I brought too much on him. <laughs> uh, so, if we look at the Muslim legacy in political thought and uh, political history, we can say that Islamic political thought and history is the harvest of the clash between four, four political moralities. The Islamic political values and the Arab anarchism and the Persian despotism and the Greek democratism. These are the main, oh, I'm sorry. I need the help of Sheikh Shoukhi as like yesterday. Um, so I think, uh, uh, actually this is what uh, the, the best mind of writing about poli Islamic political thought today are saying is that the clash between these uh, four political moralities is you know, that summarize Islamic political thought and Islamic uh, uh, political history. Let's start with the first one, Islamic political values. You know, there is debate today, is Islam has political system, Islam is um, uh, compatible, democracy or not? I don't like to, to go to that kind of debate. What I like to talk about always is Islamic political values. That there are values 
in the Islamic sacred text, in Quran and Sunnah, major values, or what I like to call in Arabic, ummahat al-qiyam siyasiyat, major political values, that are uh, uh, able, if we, if we are inspired with these values, we are able to have a very good Islamic political system. So those values, we can say quickly, justice, of course. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, this is the reason actually to send messengers and to send down messages, is to establish justice. لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلِنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ All messages, all messengers are for this reason, for this purpose, to establish justice. لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ Number two is legitimacy, which means that leaders draw their political legitimacy from people, and that's what we call in Islamic terminology shura. Three, mushawara, which means collective decision or mutual consultation in decision making. Uh, and al-ijma, consensus. Al-ijma has been transformed throughout Islamic history into a legal concept, but al-ijma actually is originally political concept. That's what ijma that we have in in the hadith, in the text, it's talking about political ijma, not about the consensus of scholars. And uh, Sheikh Allah al Vasi explained this very well in his book on Maqasid al-Sharia wa Makarimah. The concept of amana, uh, trusteeship, which means that the public office is a trust. It's not personal property. Uh, and the concept of quwa, which means in Islamic political terminology, competence. The scholars always talking al-amana wal quwa, which means the ethical part and the, the skill part or competence part. You need someone who is ethically sound, but also who is skillful. You have, you have to have these two elements to have a good leader. And ta'a is very important, especially when we see, when we come to the uh, Arabian anarchism, we know how ta'a is important. I mean, respect and obedience of legitimate leadership because the Arab don't like to obey each other as Ibn Khaldun has, has uh, noticed. And malullah, and this is a, a, a very important term used in some of the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Malullah means property of Allah. This is used for public property. It's called in, in hadith malullah. For example, there is a hadith that uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam كان يأخذ من الذي نفقة عياله سنة ثم يضع الباقي موضع مال الله. That professor, hmm? Yeah, وأتوه من مال الله اللي يأتى. So that professor last time used to to have, you know, from the the public treasure or the public property of the state, it he just take enough for the expense of his family for one year, and the rest is is, is a public property. So he separates between the private and the public here very clearly. And there is a term, الردو إلى الله والرسول. And this is what we call today equality before law. That both rule and ruler are equal. The difference is that the source of Islamic law is divine source. The source of other laws might be natural law or whatever uh, philosophy, moral philosophy behind it. But the principle is that ruler and rule are equal before uh, the law. And finally, al mudafa'a which is mentioned in the Holy Quran as that the only way to protect societies from corruption and uh, is al mudafa'a which I didn't find better translation than checks and balances. It just means that distribution of wealth, distribution of political power in a way that nobody can monopolize. Everybody is able to have his share, but also to stop others, and others are able to stop him. And that's what leads to the concept of separation of power that Montesquieu talked about in the volume 11 of his, of his spirit of laws. So in general, these are the major Islamic political values. Okay, those values unfortunately were short-lived in Islamic life. I mean, this 
values found we were practiced only in three, uh, uh, 35 years from Hijra to Medina to the Battle of Safin. I mean, during the, the state of the Prophet and the state of Khulafa Rashidin, or the rightly guided uh, caliphs. 38 years only where Muslims were based building their uh, political entity based on these political values. It's very short lived, but it's still alive. Values don't die. It's not like in science and technology you update very quickly. No, values are resilient and they don't just pass away with time. And that's why the European were inspired by the democracy, the, by the Greek democracy for thousands of years, for 2,500 years, uh, because those values didn't die. And those values also, those some political values didn't die, they're still alive. Uh, but, so this short precedent is still inspiring Muslims today. And this inspiration is similar to the inspiration of Europeans, of the inspirations, of the inspiration Europeans drew from the Greek democracy during the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. al Khilaf al-Rashida and the state of the Prophet is our Athen. So it's like the democracy of Athen in Islamic history. It's a very short period of time, but it's a very inspiring uh, period of time. Okay, the second, uh, the second moral system is the Arabian anarchism. And here, I will just read from Ibn Khaldun on that. Ibn Khaldun said, the Arabs are the least willing nations to subordinate themselves to each other, as they are rude, proud, ambitious, and eager to be leader. Sorry, no offense, but <laughs> he's just... <laughs> Uh, but Ibn Khaldun is just, as a sociologue, uh, a scholar of sociology, he saw this trait in the Arab social life. And he said, it's difficult for them to subordinate themselves to each other because they are used to no control and because they are in a state of savagery. Halat al tawahush he used in the Arabic text. This is Muqaddimah with the translation of Rosenthal. Uh, again, he said, a nation dominated by the Arabs is a nation, uh, sorry, a nation dominated, <laughs> a nation dominated by the Arabs is in a state no different from anarchy, where everybody is set against the other. Such a civilization cannot last and goes quickly to ruins, as would be the case in a state of anarchy. So if we want to understand how these Islamic political ideals disappear so quickly in 38 years, we have to understand the social structure of the Arab society, uh, at least based on the analysis of Ibn Khaldun. And the only cure for this is the religion also, as, as Ibn Khaldun himself said. And he said, for example, when the Arabs forget the religion, they no longer had any connection with political leadership, and they returned to their desert origins. Again, uh, <coughs> oh, sorry, I got confused with the two computers. Three. Mm -hmm. Arabs can obtain royal authority only by making use of some religious coloring, such as prophecy or sainthood. Nubuwatun <coughs> awwalaya. The Arabs cannot be controlled politically unless there is religious element controlling them, whether a prophethood or sainthood. And you see the prophethood, of course, the best example is the time of Prophet Sallallahu when he was able to unite all of these Arabian tribe in one very powerful political entity. But in Islamic history, we have also this example of sainthood or those 
religious leaders, like the best example, for example, close to the history of this place is Abdullah ibn Yasin, who created the movement of al muradidin al murafid And that movement was originally just religious movement, like Sufi order, and then it was transformed into a political entity. They moved from the desert of Mauritania, they, they come to Morocco, they build Marrakesh, and then they moved to Andalusia, and they control Al-Andalusia here for uh, over 60 years. Uh, all, all of it starts with uh, a preacher or uh, a Muslim uh, wali. They, they look at him as wali or saint, but uh, it's, it's political, uh, religious leader anyway. Uh, and uh, Ibn Khaldun said, the Arabs are by nature remote from royal leadership, al-mulk. They attain it only once their nature has undergone a complete transformation under the influence of some religious colony. Again, he's repeating the same uh, idea. Okay. The mirror of the Arab mentality and cultural psychology is poetry, at least the Arabs of those early ages, because poetry was their only culture. Umar ibn Khattab said about the Arab poetry, عِلْمُ قَوْمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُمْ عِلْمٌ سِوَى That's the knowledge these people they have, it's the only knowledge they have, is poetry. It's everything related to them you have to find in their poetry. Uh, if we look at these verses of poetry, it's uh, not one poem, it's from different poem. You see these, these kind of anarchy uh, mentality. One of them prided himself about, and talking about his people, and he said, من عهد عاد كان معروفا لنا أسر الملوك وقتلها وقتالها. Since the time of Ad, Ad is very old Arab tribe mentioned in the Holy Quran. Since the time of Ad, we are known of capturing and killing our kings. So they are proud to, to, keep, to kill the kings. That for them is, is a source of pride. Uh, Amr ibn Kulthum, who is uh, one of the great, greatest po poets of Arabia, pre-Islamic Arabia, also said, إِذَا بَلَغَ الْفِطَامَ لَنَا صَدِّيٌّ يَخِرُّ لَهُ الْجَبَادُرُ سَاجِدِينَ You know that the kings or the tyrant has to prostrate themselves to our baby children, to our babies. So remember that this is during a time where people are making sujood to their kings in neighboring empires, in Persia or in uh, Ethiopia, Abyssinia. You remember the story of Muslims when they went to Abyssinia. They, had a very, uh, they have a, a very difficult diplomatic problem because when they came to Najashi, the king of Abyssinia, they did not make sujood for him. And there was a problem for him, and the Qurayshi envoy Umar, Umar ibn al-Asi tried to use it against them. And when the king asked them, or, or his, his uh, people, why don't you prostrate yourself for the king? Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the leader of Muslims said, inna la nasujudu li ghayri Allah. We don't make sujud to anybody other than Allah. <coughs> so it's a matter of principle, but it was not convenient politically in that specific day. Uh, the Arabs also have this military spirit, uh, but it was a military without, with an arm, it was an army without mission. It was an army, it's ready to fight. That's why, and they were happy to fight each other all the time. It's, it's an army without mission. At-Tirimah, one of the great poets of Arabia in the first century of Islam, actually he's Muslim, but he still have that kind of military ethos of, of pre-Islamic Arabia. He said, وَإِنِّي لَمُرْتَادٌ جَوَادِي فَقَاذِفٌ بِهِ وَبِنَفْسِ الْيَوْمَ إِحْدَى الْمَقَاذِفِ I'm going to ride my horse today and I will throw myself and my horse somewhere. He doesn't know where to fight, where to attack. But he decided to attack anyway. <laughs> so it's an army without mission. Another poet said, وَأَحْيَانًا عَلَى بَكْرٍ أَخِينَا إِذَا مَا لَمْ نَجِدْ إِلَّا أَخَانَ Sometimes we attack Bakr, our brothers, if we don't find somebody else to, to, to attack. So very happy to, to fight. They love it, it's just like playing you know, in the ground. Uh, so this is the background in which those Islamic political principles were received first. And it's not an easy 
ground to, to have the seed of an established political entity with stable bureaucracy and like, like the, the, the real states. Okay, now we move from the Arabian anarchism to the Persian despotism. <coughs> German philosopher Hegel has a, an interesting book called The Oriental World. Uh, he talked about what he called Persian world. Persian world in the very general broad sense that include ancient Egypt and Persia, part of India. Uh, and he said that one of the characteristics of the Oriental world was the father patriarch in the family and the emperor patriarch in the state. So it's a patriarchal system. Start from the family and end in the state. The emperor is the father of all and the man is, the, is also the patriarch within the family. In this Oriental world, the spirit of absolute submission to rulers, to political ruler, is one of the characteristics. Exactly the opposite of what we had in Arabia before Islam. The Arabs hate to, to be controlled by anyone. It's part of their culture. The Persians actually were in a very stable uh, empire complete submission to the emperor who is almost raised to the status of a god. In Egypt is worse because, you know, Pharaoh, he said, Ana rabbukum ala. he said, I am your lord, the most high. And this leads to some sort of paganism because the ruler is raised to status of divine status. Uh, the third morality or political morality, the fourth political morality is the Greek democratism. Yes, thank you. The Greeks actually in the ancient world were, their cultures were characteristic of love for freedom. Yes, they didn't have democracy all the time, but it is really very clear trait of, of a Greek uh, world and Greek philosophy. Uh, and the question of justice, political justice, was at the heart of the Greek thought. When we read the Republic of Plato, it's all about justice. He starts the debate in the Republic about just what's the definition of justice. Uh, not justice, not that a ruler should be just in order to make people love him, like what we have in Persian culture. No, it's about justice that both ruler and rule should be equal uh, uh, and the law should be above all or nobody is above the law, and nobody is under or below the law, as Abraham Lincoln said many centuries later. And the Greek had also localized democratic experiments, the most famous of which is what was in Athens. And uh, later on, it was transformed into an empire, of, of course, like what happened in, in Islamic history. When Alexander the Great and his father, Philip before him, transform the small democracy into a military uh, mighty empire, then they lost their ideals. So what happened in Greek history is actually similar to what happened in Islamic history. You start with a free city-state. People are free to choose their leaders in Athens, uh, in Medina. And then when you have conquest, then this small free republic is transformed into a military empire. Of course, it has to lose its political ideals because you cannot be democracy and an empire at the same time, at least in the ancient time. Maybe today you have, you can, probably today. Uh, there are some countries who have democracy inside and empire outside like the US. Uh, but, this is, pract it's practically possible today, maybe, but it was not practically possible in the past. Uh, okay, what happened in this clash between these four moralities is the triumph of the Persian ethos at the end in the Islamic culture. There are some very interesting examples in, uh, in Islamic political, in the political legacy of Muslim that we have today under the title of the books of Siyas al Sharia or book of Adab Sultania or other literature. Uh, 
you find extraordinary impact of the pre-Islamic Persian Empire on this. Okay, so there is a triumph of the Persian ethos, political ethos at the end. Here is a, a nice example from Al Mubarrid's book, Al Fadil. Mubarrid is one of the great writers in, in Arabic literature. Well, his book, Al Kamil, is, is known as one of the four most important books in Arab literature. In Arabic literature. Uh, but this is another book of his, it's called Al Fadil. And he's saying a story that Al Mu'mun, the great Abbasid Caliph, uh, asked the teacher of his son, Al Wathiq, the, uh, no, no, the, the teacher asked Al Mu'mun, what kind of curriculum I should provide to your son? You know, why should, why sh what should I teach him? He told him, Kitabullahi wa ahdu ardashir, mean, teach him the book of Allah and the covenant of Ardashir. Ardashir is the founder of the Sassanid Empire. 500 years before Islam, he's the founder of the Sassanid Persian Empire. And he has a, <coughs> he left a document to his son, and it's known in Arabic as Ahdu Ardashir, the covenant of Ardashir. He's giving some political advice, practical advice to his son, how to control people, and how to be, you know, uh, to keep the empire together. This document became a reference in Islamic culture in very, in very early age. Mamun is one of the earliest caliphs in the Abbasid time. And he's putting it immediately after the Quran in importance. I mean, make him memorize the Holy Quran and teach him the covenant of Ardashi. Like we used to say, Kitabullah wa Sunnah Rasulihi. You know? But no, it's Kitabullah wa Ahdu Ardashir. Like uh, Ahd al here has become a replacement for the Sunnah of the Prophet almost. And, and make him memorize the book of Kalila wa Dimna. You know, the story of Kalila wa Dimna is very old, uh, ancient book of India, transferred into Persia and then translated into Arabic by Ibn al-Muqaffa, a Persian writer who lived in the first and second century of Hijra. And uh, it's a story of, of animals, but it's about political ethics. It's the, the, the lion as the king, the, you know, the lion king cartoon. So it's, you, ha you have the lion king, and you have other animals. Each one is playing a role uh, in this kingdom of animals. So basically, it's telling us to be animal and to submit to our uh, lion king. Uh, Al-Jahil, one of the earliest writers on Islamic political thought, he has a book called Taj. The Akhlaq al Muluk. It's interesting. The title of the book is the Taj, the Crown. Uh, uh, he talk about the kings of Persia, and he said, "وَعَنْهُمْ أَخَذْنَا قَوَانِينَ الْمُلْكِ وَالْمَمْلَكَةِ وَتَرْتِيبِ الْخَاصَّةِ وَالْعَامَّةِ وَسِيَاسَةِ الرَّعِيَةِ." From them, we took the laws of monarchy and how to deal with, you know, different classes of people, etc. Uh, and this lead to appearance of what I call political paganism, unfortunately, in Islamic culture. I mean, I understand political paganism in a pagan society. It's understood, like, per, like pre-Islam Persia. But you have political paganism within a Muslim society and Islamic culture. It it's appears in our culture because of this deep influence of the Persian political ethos, pre-Islam Persian political ethos. Al-Jahil in the same book saying, كل ما أمكن الملك أن ينفرد به دون خاصته وعامته فمن أخلاقه أن لا يشارك أحدا فيه وأول الأمور بأخلاق الملك إن أمكنه التفرد بالماء والهواء أن لا يشرك فيهما أحدا فإن البهاء والعز والأبهة في التفرد that for a king, he should be unique in everything. Even if he can monopolize water and 
and air to himself. So that's, that's good. Because to be a king means to be different, to be, not to be equal with anybody else. And this is just, uh, of course, it's far from the uh, Islamic political ethics. Uh, <clears throat> we have some great scholars uh, in the 20th century who contributed to the, who uh, contributed to the interpretation of this process of, of uh, polit Islamic political history. And they have awareness of this crisis of Islamic civilization. Among these uh, great uh, contributors uh, are Muhammad Iqbal, Abdul Razak Sanhuri, Malik Ben Nabi, Muhammad Abdul Jabiri, and Ridwan Sayyid, who's still alive. Uh, Muhammad Iqbal, uh, of course, I mentioned what, what he said, and there are other uh, remarks in his book, Reconstruction of Islamic uh, Religious Thought, in his poetry. He has some very insightful ideas about this deviation that took place in early time uh, from the Islamic political ideals. Abdul Razak Senhuri is a, a great Egyptian scholar who studied uh, constitutional law in France in the early 20th century. And he wrote a, a book that became classic in, in the uh, Islamic political thought today, which is Kitab al Khilafa. It was his PhD dissertation, I think, in Sorbonne, in French, but translated into Arabic later. Uh, and uh, he uh, tried to explain this, uh, he tried to explain why Muslim scholars wrote a little bit about political legitimacy. And he said because they are afraid of the kings, of course. Kings don't like people to talk about, to shed, show any kind of doubt about their legitimacy. Um, uh, so that, that was part of his contribution. Malik Ben Nabi treated this, this topic extensively in his book, Focation de l'Islam, in French, which is translated into Arabic, Wijhatul Alam al Islami. And he said that what happened in the year 38 of Hijra, Harb Safin, the War of Safin, the Battle of Safin, was a, a deep divide between those who assimilated the Islamic political morality and those who were enslaved by the pre-Islamic norm. That's how Malik ben Nabi interpret the Battle of Safin. And therefore, at the end of the day, those who were enslaved, as, as he said, by the pre-Islamic norm actually defeated those who assimilated Islamic political legitimacy, and that's why Muslim transform, the, the Islamic political uh, entity was transformed into monarchy. Uh, it was moved from what he called the spirit of Medina to the spirit of Damascus. You cannot have an empire in Medina at that time. Not only for practical reason, because you don't have a history of bureaucracy, but also that place that witnessed the state of the Prophet and Khulivar Rashidin cannot be transformed easily into an empire. And that's why when Muawiyah started the empire, he started in Damascus. Damascus, which was a part of Byzantine before the Islamic conquest. So Muslims inherited basically the Byzantine model and they gave it uh, Islamic face. They changed it culturally, but they didn't change the political ethos itself and political ethics itself. Later on, the Islamic political center of gravity migrated from Damascus to Baghdad, the beginning of the Abbas Empire. And remember, Baghdad also was a part of the Persian Empire. So Muslims built empire, but from the ruins of other empires. They could not build empire where in the cradle of Islam in Medina. That was impossible. But they built an empire in Damascus from the ruins of the Byzantine Empire and an empire in Baghdad from the ruin of the uh, Persian Empire. Muhammad Abdul Jabiri, Moroccan philosopher uh, who died a few years ago, he has an extraordinary deep contribution in interpreting Islamic political thought and history uh, in, in two of his major books, Al-Aql al-Siyasi al-Arabi, the, the Arab political mind, 
and العقل الأخلاقي العربي the Arab moral mind and in both books he emphasized the impact of the pre-Islam Persian culture and on Islamic political principle and I remember that he concluded actually the last sentence of his book on on the Arab moral mind he said that none of the uh, none of the Arab countries today has become free country nor Iran did because they haven't uh, they haven't buried their dead father Ardashir لم يدفنوا بعد أباهم Ardashir means the 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 Ardashir we said the founder of the Sassanid Persian Empire before Islam. So we are, we are not able still today to free ourselves from these negative. Uh, in his book, The Autumn of Middle Ages, a very important book about the Renaissance. He said that uh, Europe in the, in the 14th and 15th century uh, had become, uh, you know, is uh, depending on exhausted ideas that were inspiring in the past, but they become burden in the present. I mean, an idea can be inspiring in the past, and then it become a burden in the present. So we have to get rid of those exhausted, like, just like a tree, when you have those branches, are, on all the tree, there are some branches that are dying. You have to cut this in order to save the tree itself. Uh, so, Exhausted idea, Huizinga said, are like a tree with overripe fruits and an evening sky, a sky steeped blood, a sky steeped blood red, desolate with threatening clouds. And finally, we need to learn humbly from human wisdom. We cannot revive our ideals without enriching ourselves also with what others have. We need to avoid what Dr. Uh, Tim Winter, Abdul Hakim Murad called the poverty of fanaticism. If we deal with others with fanat with fanatical in a fanatical way, and we are not humble enough to learn from others, we will not be able to enrich ourselves. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have uh, 25 minutes. We'll take 25 minutes questions, and all the questions that are not that you are not able to ask now, you can ask them uh, this afternoon. So allow me to give the priority for the students of the uh, critical Muslim uh, studies because they won't be with us this afternoon. Sorry. We call them students. students. I call you students. I call myself no, students. Fine. Call Welcome. Student, but <laughs> you don't call them anymore. Participant. Participant? Yes. Okay. Student participants then. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. One and then two, three. No, no, you can, but uh, I give the priority. So, so we'll go for the first five. One, two, three, four. Five. And five here. I'm so, you are here this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is a mic. Uh, yes, it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Let's see if it's working. It's working? No, it's there. It's there. there. <laughs> is it working? Yes. Uh, so a question that poses itself now is, can we draw a parallel between what happened in Arabia for the caliphate and what happened in Andalusia or in the uh, Iberian Peninsula and how the developments and why the developments were, were so different? Or is there a book you recommend on that? And what are the lessons that we can learn from this? Thank you. Yes. Um, 
I have a comment and a question. Um, so my comment is um, I disagree with your um, classification of political, for political um, moralities and I have the feeling that they're very centralizing and racializing, so Arab and Persian and then using Hegel to, to show Persian uh, despotism is like, I think if we talk about um, despotism then we have to look at Europe and feudalism and feudal states. So um, my, my question is, okay, I, do, I have two questions. So one question is, what do you mean by pagan um, political um, ideas? Because even if we look at Greek, they wouldn't consider themselves pagan. Uh, they are polytheists. Um, and then my second question is, we were, to we were talking about dignity. And in your list of major political Islamic values, you didn't, you didn't have human dignity. So where do we place human dignity in Islamic values? Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, um, if, if we make an assessment of the situation today in the Arab world, um, we are still pretty much immersed in an anarchy. Uh, but we have more access to the Greek democracy, if we shall put it this way. Nonetheless, democracy has been pretty much imposed as the ideal. Um, and if we think of a transition from where we are today towards an Islamic political system, then my question is how exhausted is the democratic system that we have today and whether we do really need it to move to the Islamic political system? I mean, whether we do need it as a stepping stone to move towards the Islamic political system. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you for an interesting uh, presentation. As, as a public policy scholar, I couldn't help, uh, help it by, but uh, relate uh, the political values that you have discussed uh, to the concept of governance, um, transparency, accountability, rule of law. So, um, and I'm not trying to torture the data till it confesses, basically. But, um, but what my question is related more to the gap between the ruler and the ruled, I guess. This makes me think about, um, okay, this is what was happening in reality um, at that time. Um, I'm relating this to what they call, I've read it somewhere a long time ago, at tarikh al-siyasi versus at tarikh al-ijtima'i. So, you know, the, 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 the political, history, I guess, yes. versus the, the social history. So, I mean, you know, these political values, you know, if, if you could think about them as more like the, the, the moral, the norms, you know, that existed still in the society, although they were not maybe implemented in the political arena and, and, and so forth. So could you comment maybe on that, you know, how this relates to, to us reporting that, that history, you know? Can you make your question more clear? Um, okay. Um, is, is the gap that existed between the ruled and the ruler um, the same gap that existed between um, the implementation of these values without putting the word political behind them. You know, like the, the society was, was the society still implementing these values? Um, not from a position of power, I guess. Um, is, that, is that, I don't know. I will try okay. to understand. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. okay. <clears throat> there is one here, oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Nick. Uh, sorry. sorry. I forgot. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, to what extent do you think that the, um, the, f the political organization that we teach in fiqh as Nidam al-Hukum fil-Islam, um, to what extent do you think that that is affected um, by the Urf and by, the, the, by these different influences that 
that you mentioned um, as opposed to being um, something that that is uh, that it derives from that derives a structure from Islamic rulings. Thanks. Oh, uh, thank you all for very uh, very nice and challenging questions. Number one, the uh, comparison between what happened in the Andalus to Muslims and and what happened uh, or the anarchism of Arabia, I think, yeah, that's a very important point. And uh, actually, I think Ibn Khaldun, who's uh, from both Tunisia and the Andalus, and he's very, very aware of this situation at, at the, the end of Muslim existence in, here in, in Andalus. Um, I think one of the, probably one of the inspiration that led him to write his muqaddima with this extraordinary critical and pessimistic view of, of Islamic history is what he, he, he lived and what he learned about the fate of Muslims in Andalus. So the, uh, the, 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 all the history of the sect what we call in Arabic muluk tawaif or sectarian kings of Andalus is, is a almost a repetition of the life of Arabia in pre-Islam. It just, the only difference may be that there were tribes in Arabia and in Andalus were less tribal, but it's with full of tribal spirit. It's uh, in appearance political entities, but in fact, it's just tribalism. It's political tribalism. So uh, uh, all of this is teaching us that the structure of the Arab society didn't, was not transformed deep enough to, uh, to, to, to get rid of, the, of this, uh, of this uh, Arabian anarchism, even to the end of the 14th and 15th century. Uh, is my view essentialist? Well, I don't know, but I'm not relativist either, and that's why I was attacking relativism so much yesterday. Um, uh, but I don't think it's about essentialism. There are some general uh, assumptions about some cultures. If I say European uh, feudalism, I mean, it's no problem. It doesn't mean feudalism doesn't, didn't exist in other places, but it sounds as a descriptive way to talk about that social and political structure in Europe, I think, uh, at that time. Uh, as for uh, political paganism, I, I didn't talk about uh, pagan values, pagan political values, no, I talk about political paganism. That when, what I meant is raising the ruler to a position or a status of a god, uh, which is, was very common in some empires. Uh, so the, the Greeks were pagan, but they didn't make their rulers gods. Uh, the Persians were pagan, and they made their rulers gods. The Egyptians were pagan, and they made their rulers gods. So I'm talking about political paganism, and not just uh, a paganism uh, per se. Uh, human dignity as a, a political value, maybe that's a very valid uh, point to add. Uh, I have to think about it to see if will, I will add it to the list that I have with what I call the major uh, political values in, uh, uh, in Islam. As is democracy uh, one of the uh, Questioners talk about that democracy is imposed. No, I don't think democracy is imposed on us. I wish it is imposed on us, actually, but it was not. Uh, what was imposed on us is dictatorship. And the allies of the uh, Western countries and also international powers in general is, uh, are always the dictators. Uh, so, uh, Nobody imposes democracy on us. Yes, some, some will talk about spreading democracy, but we know the double talk about that. It's something to be said to the public inside 
the U.S. or public inside the European country, but uh, nobody is imposing or even supporting democracies in our countries. Everybody in, in the international uh, powers, whether U.S. or Russia or China or European major countries, are supportive of dictators. But each one has his favorite dictator. Yeah, I mean, Russia has Assad, and uh, U.S. has Sisi. Everybody is reminding me of Sisi today. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, everybody has his favorite dictator, but they are, there is a consensus of, to be supportive of those dictators, unfortunately. Uh, is democracy exhausted? No, it's not exhausted. But the social morality is exhausted in some democratic country. And our hard debate yesterday about same-sex marriage is just an example of that that social morality exhausted. Doesn't mean that democracy is exhausted. Actually, I don't think that democracy will ever be exhausted. Maybe I'm too much Hegelian on this, and the theory of end of history that Hegel talked about after the French Revolution. No, I don't think that open societies get exhausted. No, because there is a mechanism of self-correction. So, and that's why I'm very hopeful that Western countries will find in Islam and in the Muslim communities, a new inspiration to revive the social morality in these countries without change in the democratic system. Actually, the democratic system is what is allowing Muslims today to inspire the society because you are in a free market of ideas and ideals. You just need to work hard to, be, uh, to inspire others. Uh, so I, I don't believe that uh, open societies get, uh, have declined in the sense of hist historical philosophy uh, or philosophy of history. We talk about decline of civilization. No, democratic countries don't be in decline in the sense of decline of civilization because of the self-correction mechanism, because it's an open society. I mean, they can convert to Islam tomorrow if they want, uh, they can be very conservative tomorrow if they want. Uh, so there, there is a, an, an open uh, space of options that made this self-correction possible all the time. Sometimes it comes late, but it comes at the end anyway. Uh, public policy and the gap between ruler and rule, which is uh, a question I didn't understand 100%. Uh, but uh, uh, I like to say that Islamic political legacy that we have today is mainly about public policy and not about political legitimacy. It's almost silent about political legitimacy. And that's why at Kyle we have decided to have a workshop, inshallah, on a siyas al sharia wa sharia siyasiya. So, Siyasa Sharia, the books that we have under the title Siyasa Sharia, it's about public policy mainly. It's not about political legitimacy. It doesn't, it doesn't treat the essential questions of the, the origin of state, the source of legitimacy, the relation, moral and legal relation between rule and rule. They don't treat that, maybe sometimes in paragraph, very short chapters. And so it's mainly about how to manage existing uh, order, not to change the existing order. So what we need today is to move from siyasa sharia to a sharia siyasiya. We need to go to the root uh, of the crisis, uh, the crisis of Islamic uh, civilization. Last question, uh, what we study today under the Islamic political system, how how far it is influenced by these different political moralities. I think uh, I explained that. It's very deeply influenced by that. Sometimes you don't see it explicitly. I mean, the other will not tell you Kisra said or Ardashir said, uh, but it is there. It is already internalized many centuries ago, this kind of uh, 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 
despotism, morality, the morality of despotism, it was internalized within the Islamic political ethics, unfortunately. So it's, it's now, the challenge now is how to separate between this and what is Islamic, I mean what is explicitly stated in the Islamic text. Definitely Islamic text doesn't accept people to raise a ruler to a status of a god. That will be completely against anything uh, uh, that Islam stands for. Definitely Islam uh, in political legitimacy is a contractualist uh, ethical system. I mean, it's about contract. It's a contract. Public office is not personal property. Public wealth is not personal property. It's very clear from the text itself, from Quran and from Sunnah, from the saying of Prophet, from the practice of the Prophet himself. And the only ideal we have to follow is the ideal of the Prophet. Islamic history is open to criticism. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we still have seven minutes so is that for those who are not here this afternoon so one where okay 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 we want we will take the three that are not here this afternoon one two and three are you here this afternoon okay so you are not it's both but I think that you are going to visit uh, the Alhambra Sorry? So who, who is not here this afternoon? Okay, we'll take the three of you. One, one, two, and, and okay, where is the mic? The mic is here. So, can you, so uh, short questions, please. Okay, um, Jazakallah uh, for that uh, brilliant lecture. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Just, uh, I'll try to keep it short. Um, uh, just a quick, um, well, just to make it uh, short. Uh, you said that, uh, well, did, did empire destroy Islamic values or did building empire on pre-Islamic principles destroy Islamic values? So my question is, isn't Islam essentially expansionist and wasn't it expansionist even before the Battle of Sifin? Um, and if that is the case, uh, does this then uh, justify uh, selective epistemicide? Say, for example, should you have ideally destroyed pre-Islamic political knowledge and kept the scientific knowledge in order to progress as an Islamic civilization. Um, and also finally this uh, relates to uh, 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 the point of pluriversalism and I'd like to ask Ramon this question. Um, if pluriversalism is the answer, uh, how do you envision the end goal in terms of uh, a structure of organization? Are you talking about nation states? Are you talking about tribalism? Are you talking about a, a benevolent hegemonic system uh, like an Islamic system within which there are several structures of knowledge, several worlds, so to speak, but with, a, with one world or one order of knowledge to rule them all. I take note of your question for this afternoon. I think the opportunity should be given to him to answer. Okay. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, okay, so my, uh, my question relates to, uh, to the previous question and uh, it's derived from Ridwan Sayed's book. Um, okay, so Ridwan Sayed explains that uh, no, uh, Islam is essentially expansionist, and um, that uh, you know society had to, to uh, the Islamic society had to to keep its own authority, and uh, away from the political authority, uh, deriving from the concept that uh, the ummah needs to be um, like uh, in a sense um, gathered together. Uh, so uh, they had to, uh, in order to escape the, the bloodshed and all this, uh, they had to stay away from politics and uh, have uh, some sort of autonomous society. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the first question. And second, like, uh, he says that uh, expansion is, uh, was, uh, no, the, uh, in a sense, the, the um, politics of expansion was necessary to keep the, the, uh, the empire together after the... Arabic anarchism, so uh, you know, uh, he says that it, it is impossible to keep the empire after the, pro uh, the prophet's death if, they d uh, if Abu Bakr and the rest of the caliphs didn't uh, go and, and unite Arabs under the mission of uh, expan expansion. 
So, yeah, that's my question. Assalamu alaikum. Um, so my question is in response to your stated, um, I guess, desire for democracy and the idea of it being self-correcting. Um, in a context where we see a lot of uh, so-called democracies that are essentially run by those uh, with money who can influence power, um, and in situations where across the world we're seeing uh, it's, it's a tyranny of the majority or a, t a tyranny of those with powers, where we see, uh, for example, the rights of Muslims in particular being uh, very uh, strongly sort of uh, those rights being removed one by one, uh, one country to another. How can we um, envision a, a society where um, if we have a, a non-Muslim society that we're living within uh, and democracy isn't working um, and obviously these, uh, these empires are, are long gone, how can we uh, sort of con uh, work within the system where we're recognizing that not all of the uh, values of uh, Islamic, leader Islamic leadership excuse me, are going to be present um, in, in those societies, but we still need to, to find ways to make those uh, work. Yes, there is one here. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate the um, the internal look and not uh, necessarily putting all the burden on the Europeans. Um, my question uh, relates to the fact that you mentioned uh, Imama is the biggest source of ikhtilaf amongst the, the Muslims there in the words of Ibn Khaldun. Um, and that either I mean a prophet... Sh Shahrastani. Shahrastani, right, yeah. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And either a prophet or a saint must rule over the Arabs. So. Is it a fetishized fantasy to call uh, Medina our Athens uh, if we do not have a prophet amongst us? How do we get around that? Uh, should we turn to Athens or some other system since this particular requirement is there? And then the other question I have uh, regards to your, uh, this uh, notion of a, um, uh, a pagan politics. Uh, I think Persia was uh, Zoroastrian and they had a very strong uh, culture of uh, consulting the Zoroastrian priest, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a monotheistic re religion with Ahur Mazd at the, the top of it. So, I want to press against uh, that kind of terminology as well. Thank you. Okay, you have three minutes. <laughs> well, uh, empire and values. W what I was trying to say is that um, you cannot have a free society and an empire practically in the ancient time, just for simple practical reason. You cannot have a democracy that have its border in Azerbaijan and uh, the other, the western border in Spain. That by practical term, you cannot do that. And uh, number two, also the military expansion had its own logic and all empire when they expand too much, they got exploded from inside and I think the war of Safin is the Islamic explosion after extraordinary fast expansion. You can say in a, uh, a rough metaphor that Muslims at the time ate more food than, than what they can digest. So they just ate too much in a very few years. And therefore the structure was not so strong also because of the lack of, of the uh, strong tradition of bureaucracy. The source of strength of state is whether the ideals or the structure. So there was no structure in Arabia before Islam. There is no tradition of standing army and bureaucracy and palaces like in Rome, in Byzantium, for example, or Persia. So that was the structural weaknesses that Islam suffered, Islamic history suffered from these structural weaknesses all the time. Uh, and the ideals also with all of this expansion and, and conversion and superficial conversion and tribalism also, uh, so people are not able to hold. Uh, yeah, Ridwan Sayyid, uh, actually he, he, he brought a very nice uh, 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 equation that I like to emphasize here. He said that Muslims sacrifice political legitimacy to, in order to save their unity. And this is the logic that uh, control Islamic history since the, war, the, the Battle of Safin. But the lesson of history, of Islamic history, is that 
If you sacrifice political legitimacy, you will also lose unity on the long term. So you, you will lose both. If you sacrifice political legitimacy in order to keep the country together or the nation together, you will lose both legitimacy and unity on the long term. Because without political legitimacy, uh, it means just anyone who is the most powerful will take uh, the, the leadership and the other one will fight him or her and then so we'll destroy everything at the end. Uh, democracy is not working in this country and it's uh, bought by rich people. Well, I, I, I like to distinguish always between equity and equality. There is equity in these countries. It means you are equal before the law. You are equal by law. That doesn't mean that you will be equal in fact, some people are more efficient than others. Some people, well, you just need to be efficient. So you don't blame people. If you have equal opportunity, he's more efficient or he's more wo hardworking. Don't blame the system. Don't blame the law. The law said that you have equal opportunity. So what is, what is expected from the law is equity, is, which means equal opportunity. Doesn't mean equality. In, in reality, equality in reality is something that you achieve with your effort. It's, the law will not make it for you. The law just gave you the opportunity for, for, for that. Yeah, the law, the law in, in all of these Western democracies, the law doesn't prevent any Muslim from being president of the country, for example. What? So that's the highest position in the country. But the law doesn't prevent you from being president of France, for example. Doesn't. Yeah, that is a social, economic, and other facts. But in political morality, what is needed is equality by law. That is what political morality will provide. So if there are other factors, Historical, social, you need affirmative action or all kind of those kinds. That's, that's a different issue. Uh, but you cannot expect from the law to, uh, to make equality in reality. The, the, what the law gave is potential, that opportunity for equality. Uh, should we uh, look uh, to others because the model of Medina didn't work? Well, the, the model of Aden didn't work also, and I think it's just simply there are a lot of structural problems, and especially in the time of empire and what Hobbes called the war of all against all, it's not easy to keep a free society because the survival, the instant of the survival is more important than freedom in that kind of society. So the military, powerful military leaders will automatically become political leaders because you are in a state of war. Just like when France was occupied by the Nazis, de Gaulle became de facto leader without election during the, the, the French resistance of Nazis. Well, you cannot have election while you are occupied country. So the, we have to look at it in this sense of those empires were living in this kind of spirit of the war of all against all. And it's very hard in that kind of environment to have uh, legitimate, political legitimacy. And that's why the Medina was an exception, and Athens was an exception. But today, we, are much, we have much more better structure to have legitimate uh, government. Uh, as for uh, the last question about Persian, uh, were the Persian monotheistic or pagans? Of course. This is a, it's a very controversial question in Islamic history. I'm teaching history of religion. I know some scholars, during the time of Sahaba said, no, Zoroastrians are monotheistic and they should be treated the same way as people of the book. And other scholars said, no. And this is a very old debate. Uh, well, at least as a student of history of religion, I don't think Zoroastrian was monotheistic of religion more than uh, 
uh, Hinduism and other religions, for example. In all of these religions, you can find under the paganism, under the, co the paganist uh, cover, some uh, a monotheistic ideal or idea, like the belief in this spirit of the world and that. Uh, but this is, it's too abstract to make it monotheistic in the term, terminology of monothe monotheistic religions. So what today we teach monotheistic religion, uh, I teach a class on monotheistic religion, which is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and there are class on what we call oriental religions, which include Zoroastrianism, Hinduism, and uh, others. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Shankriti. So you have uh, 12 minutes, 15 minutes. We start at 10 to 1. Okay?